it's very rare in a lifetime. They say if you could count your friends on a hand. But it's even rarer to have someone that you forge a relationship with. He came alongside of me. He takes the title of associate pastor, but he's not the associate pastor. He's the pastor. And I'm privileged to labor with him. Such a man of God and die, you such an example. But let me, here's where I'm going. I'm trying to get there to introduce him. I saw something and witnessed something that was so unreal. A love of a mother and father for their child. I witnessed 1 Corinthians 13. I watched for hours them stroking Nathan, never leaving his side, sleeping on uncomfortable pieces of furniture, but never giving up hope. His children are a testimony to their commitment to the, to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you that I have such admiration for them. And I couldn't imagine facing what they're facing right now. I can tell you they, that we went down swinging. We didn't go down easy. Matter of fact, when we went to make the arrangements at Moth's funeral, I'm infamous there because of an incident. And they wanted to actually not leave the body here because they were afraid we were going to try to raise them. That's a compliment. But that tells you we have no quit in us. And this is the type of brother that has come alongside of me and I've come alongside of him. And uh, I have a relationship forged in the love and respect. And I know it's going to be very, very difficult. Imagine Pastor Bill standing here in just a moment. It's going to be very difficult for him to preach this funeral. But I shared with him, there's nobody else can preach this funeral like you can preach this funeral. Amen? So I want to introduce to you someone I have the utmost respect has grown leaps and bounds in my eyes and has left me with an example of what it is to love. If you could have witnessed what I witnessed, it would blow your mind. It wasn't for the lack of prayers that Nathan's laying there. It wasn't for the lack of love. It's something that both him and I will have to go down the road and ask some serious questions. Why? But nevertheless, our faith has not wavered one moment. Our trust in him has not changed. And our love for God is steadfast. I want you to welcome a real man of God, Pastor Bill Fisher. Love you, brother. Love you, brother. I got, I got them to Come on, give the Lord a praise in here. Come on, give the Lord a praise. He's worthy to be praised, amen. Hallelujah. Glory. You can go ahead and be seated. Wow, I'm overwhelmed. The last two days have just been incredible. I'm... I'm 
Every time that I think about what's happened yesterday, the turnout, the people that took time out to come and pay their respects and, and to honor our family and to honor Nathan has just been absolutely overwhelming. I have never in my life experienced what I've experienced in these last two days. Look at this. We've had politicians buried here. Uh, not buried, but we've done their services. Thank God. Yeah. Don't look under the seat. He might be there, okay? <laughs> but we've, we've done services for some pretty powerful people. And I've never seen the turnout, the response, the love, the respect that I've witnessed and that my family's witnessed. And you know something? And, it, and it, I know it comes from our our home family here, our church family, but it's also come from another family as well that, to be very open with you, I never knew that there was that much love and care in Bell Chase, Louisiana. Amen. Come on. Amen. You guys have taken it over the top. I mean, you have gone the extra mile. You know, the scripture says if somebody asks you to go one mile, it says go two miles. Just do the extra. You weren't asked anything. How, much extra, how greater of an act of love and kindness have you expressed to me and my family than what this community, this church, this whole area, and you may be from West We Go, wherever, Marrera, whatever your location is, the love that you've expressed is just absolutely mind-boggling. But you know what? It helps me as a father. It helps my wife as, a, as Nathan's mother and our whole entire family to just look back and say that our son's life was not something that ended in vain. That somehow he made a difference. Somehow he had an impact upon somebody's life. I had a dear friend of mine that walked up in here earlier, just came in, he, was in a, he had a tight schedule today, and um, he walked up to me and he said, you know what's amazing? He said, what's amazing is that some people could live 70 years and not impact the amount of people that this young man right here impacted in 20 years. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right, and I've never heard it that way before. We're just honored to, and we're blessed for your love that you have showed to us. The times that you've taken to pray and to seek God and to take time out of your schedule and to put your matters aside that are burdensome to you and things that you, are, that you care about and you have to deal with, that you would be willing to push them aside and say, Lord, I ask you to touch that family, help Nathan, help their family. And the times that you, you people that gave generously just blessed us, our, our church that helped support us while we were able to be there and in the last nine months spend some of the most challenging times of our life, but at, at the same time, some of the most wonderful times of our life. Amen? Because what we experienced through this young man right here was absolutely incredible. You know, everybody was telling their story. Well, I got one too. I, got, I get my shot at telling a story about Nathan. Nathan's nickname was Squirrel. That was his, that was my pet, that was my nickname for him, Squirrel. And if anybody was around him for five minutes, they'd know why I called him Squirrel, because he couldn't sit still. Okay? I mean, we had a tree. I'm going to tell you a couple of them. We had a tree outside this this building here and every time I walked out of service on a either Sunday morning Sunday evening or Wednesday I'd walk out the service and this tree was pretty big I'd hear giggling in the tree and the leaves rustling and it was Adam and his brother squirrel up in the tree so our maintenance man came to us one day and he says, look, man, we got to cut this. We got to do something, man. These kids are all up in the tree and they, somebody's going to get hurt, you know, and what have you. Well, I knew who he was talking about. He was talking about my kids being up in the tree. Okay, he was trying to be nice about it. So we trimmed the branches to where I could stand up, and that's about eight foot, off the ground where you couldn't touch the first branch. We trimmed them all the way up the tree. I said, that's it. We got them now. 
I walked out the next service. He, 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 he. He, 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 he. You know? I'd go into the department store, you know, and we'd be in there shopping. Huh, Mom? <laughs> Man, the next thing you know, where they at? Where they at? And we couldn't find them. You, know, you don't know how many security guards I went to and said, my kids are missing. You got to block the door. Don't let nobody in. Don't let anybody out. I had to go there and shut the whole shop down just so I could find my kids. And the next thing you know, I'm looking around for Nathan, and he's in the middle of the pants rack that's in a circle, and he's in the middle. <laughs> and I could hear him. He was a great joy. I bought a brand new van, real nice custom van, Boy, and um, my wife loaded the kids up in the car and in the van and started it up and she forgot something, ran in the house, had to get it. And next thing you know, my van goes clean through the garage door. <laughs> now I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out who was driving. He went through the, the garage door. It was a fiberglass garage door. And I, and I didn't know about it because they didn't want to tell me about this. But I don't care if you told me or not. It was pretty obvious. Because when I drove up to my house, I'm looking and I'm going, what is that hole doing in the front of my house? He drove the whole van completely through the entire the, the garage door. But you know what? He was an active child. But I'm going to tell you one thing about him. There was never a time that he would go by you where he wouldn't hug you. I mean, every time he saw you, he didn't care what was going on. You know, one of the, one of the things that I, I love the most is that Nathan would always come up from behind me and he would hug me like this and put his head next to mine, his face next to mine and go, I love you, Dad. I know I'm going to miss that. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's who, that's who you're honoring here today. He loved y'all. Let me, let me just share a little bit. These last nine months were just, let me just put it mildly, it was hell on earth. But one thing, you know, we as parents, we raise our children. And we're constantly telling them, do this, don't do this. We're constantly, as they get older and they start making decisions on their own, then we try to give input, hoping, hoping that they can begin to learn how to reason, how to be able to make good decisions by giving them suggestions and input. And hopefully they grow and they mature and they come to a place where they're, they can begin to make decisions on their own and make good quality decisions because they've learned how to assimilate information and factor things in and begin to make the right decision. And all my life and all our lives, my wife and I, we purposed to do that. That was our ambition, you know, to raise our kids, to train them in the way that they should go. And when they got older, they would not depart from it. That's what the scripture says. Our whole life has been the training our kids. We raised our children in a, Christ, in a Christian home, and we also sent our kids to a Christian school. And I can remember... You know, there was a day when my son came to me, Nathan, and he said, well, it really started with Aaron. Aaron went to Christian schools all his life, and I have nothing against that. There's a great value there, but let me just take it one step further. And we, we had a decision to make one day. Should we continue to send our kids to a Christian school or let them go to a, a public school and participate in and be involved in the sports that they desire to be involved with and to get an education? Now, I'm just going to be very open with you. When me as a, as a pastor and as, and as a believer, you want to provide the best atmosphere. You want to make sure that the education they're going to get is great. You want to make sure that the people that they're going to be around are going to be influential and have their heads on straight and, and really be a, a, an institution that's moving in the right direction to create and to instill in young people the ability to be able to become successful in life. And we began to contemplate whether or not to send. And my first decision was with my son Aaron, who went to Bell Chase and graduated from Bell Chase, played baseball for Bell Chase, and we had a wonderful experience there. 
And that set the stage and that really opened the door to where I would make a decision later on when Adam and Nathan would come to me and say, Dad, we want to go to a public school. I put Adam in the, in the middle school and we put Nathan in the high school as a freshman. And to be honest with you, I was very nervous because I didn't know what to expect. They had never been in an environment like that. And before you know it, I got a phone call one day where Adam messed up in class. You know how you, you cough and you say a word at the same time? Okay? All right, yeah, yeah, look, he's hanging his head. This is my turn, okay? I had to go face the disciplinarian for him, okay? But you know what? He did something ridiculous, and he was trying to fit in with the group, you know? He, he didn't know exactly, so he just started doing things. But you know, I want to say something here. As they began to grow and they began to get involved with the school, it was the best decision that my wife and I ever made to allow our children to go to a school, to go to a school that didn't, you know what, in public schools these days, and this is just me, they don't allow you to lift up the name of Jesus. They want to take everything away that resembles is associated with the name of Jesus or with Christianity and I think that's a shame because kids need to know about Jesus Amen. kids need to know what it is to have a savior and a deliverer deliverer and to have someone that is the truth the way and the life amen and so you know when we sent them there we knew that that wasn't going to be the emphasis like it would have been in a regular Christian school but you know what I found out? I found out that it was the best thing that we ever decided because here's what happened, folks. They were put in a situation and in an environment where their faith and what they believed and what they were taught and what they had been instructed to do as far as, far as doing right was challenged in many, many ways. And you know what? I thank God to this day. First of all, I thank the teachers of Bell Chase High School, I thank the coaches that worked with our sons, that taught them right and wrong, how not to quit. When they got slack, let's get moving. Let's get in there and play. Let's get in there and work hard. And you know something? I began to realize that this institution, this school, this high school, began to have a definite impact upon my sons and I was gr glad for it. And the reason why is because what they believed, what their faith was grounded in, they believe in the Lord. And they knew that Jesus was their, their Savior. And may, they may not have walked around preaching the Word every moment of the day, but you could see in their lives they had something deep down inside that made them do the right thing and try to, be, uh, to behave and to be... Uh, to respond to authority and respect authority and it challenged them and the challenge became something that developed them and made them the young men that they are today you have contributed greatly to our children and I want to thank that thank the the Bell Chase High School for what they did but you know what along the way from what I saw last night and what I've seen today I've realized something not only did Bell Chase and the people that they associated with and the families that they were involved with and the sports that, and the coaches and everyone that had an, an opportunity to instill and impart into our children values and principles of being successful, I began to realize after last night and today that there was something else that was taking place. And what it was was this. It was that they, not only was the school affecting them, but they began to affect the people that they came in contact with. And I feel very safe. I feel very safe in my heart. I'm not bragging, folks. I never bragged on my kids. I never tooted their horns other than the fact that I was very proud of them. And when they'd come home from the game, I'd watch the game films and tell them where they missed a tackle and where they should have been at and, where, and that they were loafing and they were goofing off. I remember one time Nathan was in a game and he got kicked out the game. And Coach Becknell, I want to tell you the truth, I sat in those stands and I was so upset with Nathan. And you want me to tell you what I thought was going on while he was taking out the game? I thought you yanked him out the game 
because he was slacking that week in practice and didn't put forth the effort that he needed to, and he yanked him out the game and set him on the sideline. But then when I got home, I was, ye- I was getting on Nate. I wasn't yelling, but I was getting on him. Why did you slack? Why did the coach pull you out the game? Uh, you, you know you're supposed to work hard. You're supposed to practice. You're supposed to put forth the effort, son. Come on now, Nathan. Let's get with the g- program here. And he looks at me and he says, Dad, the ref kicked me out the game. <laughs> I said, I missed something along the way here. He said, the ref kicked me out there. I said, for what? He said, well, first of all, I taunted the ref. I yelled at the ref because somebody gave me a cheap shot and I yelled at the ref, come on, where's the flag? Like that. And he said, that's your first warning, buddy. And then later on, he knocked somebody, he made a tackle and he jumped up and he was taunting the guy as he was running off the field and and they threw him out the game. But you know something? Along the way, there came a year in his 11th year at school, he was faced with a tremendous challenge. And I'm going to share this with you to show you what type of young man Nathan was. He was faced with a challenge where his grades were not always the best. And unfortunately, his grades kept him from playing the year, that year in his junior year. And the day that Coach Becknell called us and and informed us of the decision that had to be made, and regretfully so, he expressed to me that he didn't want to sit Nathan down because Nathan was a starter. That boy sat in that room and he cried. I've never seen Nathan cry that hard in my life. And he, he was disappointed in a major way. And I remember what happened that right after that. He was faced with a decision, and the decision was this. Should I quit now that I can't play, or should I just continue to go to practice, but yet know in, that I'll never play a down, not one play, for the, re, for, the, for the regular games? Go to practice, work hard, but never have the reward of being a starter in not one game for that whole entire season. And I can remember he came home one day and he told me, he says, Dad, I think I'm going to quit the team. And I said, really, son? I said, to be honest with you, Nathan, I said, if I've ever been able to speak into your life, I want to tell you this, son. I I think you're making a wrong decision. I think you're making a wrong decision. Well, it just so happened he heeded to the words and the instructions that I gave him or the, the input. He went every day and practiced, and he worked hard, but never played one down in a regular game that season. He stood on the sidelines, and he cheered his team on, and he encouraged people, let's go, we can win. He stood by the coach's sides and wrote down the offensive and defensive plays that were being called with a notebook in his hand and a pen in the other. He stood there knowing that he had the ability and the talent to be out there playing as a starter. But because of another issue, it made him ineligible. Later in that season, we lost one game that year. And as a result of losing that particular game, I remember distinctively there was a young man that was a starter on on, uh, on Bell Chase's defense. And when he lost that game, they went to practice that week, and he made a decision and said, I quit, and he walked off the field and never played another down. And guess what? They went to the Superdome that year, and they won the 4A state championship. When it came time for the awards to be handed out, Coach Becknell called me up and said, Mr. Fitzgerald, because of Nathan's hard work and dedication and being a part of this team, he said, we're going to honor him as we honor all the rest of the players. And we're going to honor him. We're going to give him a championship ring. We're going to give him all the plaques. We're going to give him all the awards that every other player on that team got. You know what happened from that moment on? I saw something change in my son's life. 
I saw something so distinctive, a distinctive change in his life that it really set a course and set a fortitude in Nathan like nothing else that he had ever done in his life. And from that day forward, he was never the same person. And he received the, all of the awards. But there was something else that he received that was greater than the plaques and the rings, and it was wonderful. And we were honored that they would do this for our son. That never got a chance to play one regular down. But he was there at practice helping the offense get better by playing against them in, in, during practice. But you know something? This is what happened, folks. My son learned what it meant to not quit. He learned what it was to not give up. And from that day forward, I saw something distinctive in my son and so wonderful that he would, when he set his mind to doing something, oh, and he could clown, folks, but when he set his mind to doing something, he would get it done. He worked diligently, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, making his money. And as Adam said, he made money and he spent it. And he spent it on some high dollar stuff. I needed to manage that a little bit, but, you know, we were beyond that. But let me tell you how that came into play with what we just went through. Every day, I would look at Nathan. How you doing, champ? I called him champ. <laughs> I called him champ. And he would throw his thumbs up like this and he'd go, I got this one, Dad. I got this one, Dad. And he would be in pain. He would be hurting. There would be things going on in his body that he had no control over. And every time he would say, I got this one, Dad. There's another little thing that we would do. He loved this four-wheeler. We, we got him a bike. He wanted one. I got it to him because it was an incentive for him to get through this. I saw my boy go through things that I wish that no other parent on this planet would ever see their child endure, face, fight, or battle with. But there was one thing. Remember a minute ago I said that we teach our kids all of our lives to do things? Well, guess what? He taught me. I had a lot of people tell me, don't go up there and do this service. It's going to be too difficult. But you know something? My son taught me how not to quit. My son taught me how to fight. My son taught me that through it all, he never complained. He had one complaint that I remember of. You know what it was? It was because a dear friend of his asked him to stand in his wedding and be one of the, uh, you know, the groomsmen. And he couldn't make the wedding, and he complained about that a little bit. But beyond that, he never complained. He smiled, thumbs up, pedal to the metal. He was there. He was determined to get through this. He was determined to beat this. And let me tell you why, folks. I'm going to tell you exactly why Nathan wanted to beat this. There was a lot of reasons. One, he was in love. That's a big motivator. Amen? Hallelujah. Make you go yank a bumper off of a truck, man, when you're in love. Amen? Do something. Do something. Run through a wall. Whatever it is. I you know, when you're in love, it's a motivation. You know it. Amen? That make you do all those silly things. He was in love with a young lady that I will forever hold dear in my heart because she saw him at his best and she saw him at his very worst. And she stood there when he went home to be with the Lord. And I watched how she handled it. And I am so proud of Megan. And I want her parents, grandparents, her her relatives that are here today to know that you can be very, very proud of that young lady because she was absolutely sterling. She was incredible. She gave my son hope. She encouraged him. 
She motivated him. When we couldn't get him to do something, call him, get Megan over here right now because we know she'll get him to do it. And she'd walk in and say, hey, buddy, you need to suck it up and let's do it. And that's just what he'd do. He'd suck it up and do it because he knew that was the right thing. But also it's because of what was instilled in him about not quitting and not giving up that caused him to fight as long as he did. But you know something else that really blessed my heart was the dream that Nathan had. And I want to share it with you in closing today. Because this young man had a dream for his community. He had a dream for everybody that came through those doors last night, every family that's prayed for him, everyone that has even given any type of concern or interest to this whole matter that my family and I just walked through. He had a dream for every one of you. We sat down many days and we talked about it and we communicated. And he told me, Dad, I can't wait to get out of here. He said, I can't wait for God to heal me. I can't wait till I'm over this. Because you know why, Dad? And I'd say, why, son? He said, because I'm believing that my life is going to be a testimony to my friends and to the people that I know that, that truly God is real and that God loves them and He wants to save them. And he would tell me that time and time and time again. Dad, I can't wait to get out of here because i got a world to win. I can't wait to get up out of this bed, walk out of here cancer-free because I'm going back home and I want to tell everybody about the wonderful love of God. That was his dream. And his dream was is to see this community, this, this region, this area touched with the love of God. That people would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because after all, one of the greatest attributes that Nathan had was that he had a lot of love in his heart. He never wanted anybody arguing, contending, fighting. He was always the peacemaker in our home. I would get upset at something and he'd come over and go, Dad, 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 come on, come on, Dad. All right, we're going to work this out, Dad. And I'd be ranting and raving like always, okay? But you see, he was a peacemaker. He had a love in his heart. He had a love for each and every one of you. He prayed that God would touch this community. He prayed that the Lord would use him to somehow impact a life and touch a life that would bring change and bring them into the wonderful relationship that he had with the Lord. Some may say, well, how wonderful is that, that he's in the, where he's at right now? Let me tell you something. It goes beyond this. This is not the end. This is not the end. I heard a preacher say one time that when you, come, when you have an issue or a tragedy in your life, don't put a question mark there. He said, because if you put a question mark, you will always wonder why, and you'll never move on. He said, put a period there, the end of the chapter, and let's move on to another chapter in our lives. This is not the end. He's with the Lord. The Word of God promises us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. You see, but at the same time, his desire is, is that everyone in here would hold on to the same Savior and Lord and have the same faith that he had as a young man because he really loved the Lord with all of his heart. And that love that he had for God was the love that he, you came in contact with. The ones that were touched by him, that saw him, had time with him, got to know him. You knew that he really wasn't a child that was contentious, argumentative, in your face with an attitude. He was a loving young man because he had something real in his life. And his, his name is Jesus Christ. And so his dream and his desire was that no one, be it come to this or him alive today, would go without knowing and experiencing the love that God has demonstrated to us by giving us his son, that who laid down his life so that you and I could have a relationship with him and come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and live and experience the goodness of God. I know there's a lot of things and a lot of faiths and beliefs in this room today, but I'm going to tell you one thing above all. 
His name is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. And He is the light. And any man or woman that calls upon His name shall be saved. That was Nathan's dream. He wanted to go and set the world on fire. But you know where he wanted to start at? Right here. Right in this community. Right in this area. Because he loved you. And he had a burden for you. I want to just take it. Just one more moment. I know we've gone long. But this is my son I'm talking about. So you know how parents are. You want to see some pictures? <laughs> Amen. I want to say this to all these young people in here. You know why I told this young man that wrote this song? I'm so impressed with, with this young man and, and the, gentle, the young man that put the, the music together and all of this. Come on. Come on, you can give him a hand. <laughs> buddy, you don't know how much you bless me, buddy. You have no clue. All of us in here. But you, you know something... You know, he, when I first contacted him, he said, look, I can tone it down. I can bring my guitar and I can sing it. I said, hey, no, I don't want that. I said, I want it. I don't care if you're bouncing off the walls and, we, and we're doing the hey and the ho oh and hey. Whatever. Whatever. Come on now. We get too churchy sometimes. We've got to take off the religious facade. And let's be real. We're real up in here. Amen? Jesus is real. Hallelujah. But you know, the thing about it is, is that I told him, man, I want you to sing it just like, it, like you wrote it, buddy. God gave it to you that way. You sing it just like I, the Lord gave it to you. But let me share this. See all you young people up in here? I have a ton of, a, a ton, a, a, um, tons and tons of respect for what you did to show your love and you're and your honoring my son here today. The former baseball team that he played for the state championship with, the Bell Chase baseball team seated in the back here that took their one o'clock game and contacted the, opponent, uh, the op uh, opposing team and changed it to six o'clock this afternoon so they could be here to honor our family and to honor Nathan Fitzgerald. Amen. Well deserved. Amen. I had that young man sing that song that way because that was for you. It may not have been for the older crowd. You know, me and rap, we got to rap about it a little bit, okay? But for the younger crowd, I told him to do it because you know why? Nathan's burden, Nathan's desire was to see you young people, young men and women that are in here today, that are just really starting out in life, really starting to begin to make strides, preparing yourself through education in colleges, etc., getting ready to graduate and making decisions of where to go next, what direction should I go in, what does my future hold, trying to figure out and, and decide what's the best thing for you, for your future. I want to tell you today, Nathan knew what the best thing was for you, for your future. And it was to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And his desire was is that he would be able to come here and tell you today, or at an, as, as he went throughout the community, to tell you that there is no other way. You need to make decisions about where you're going at for college. Ask the Lord. He'll direct your steps. Come on now. You need to make decisions for your future and, and whatever you're going to be doing as far as your career and what are you going to invest your life in. There's no greater place to go but to the feet of the Lord and say, Lord, I need your wisdom. He says if you lack wisdom to ask of him and he'll give it to you. I'm, I'm speaking to the young people here today because you know something? I want you to be successful. I want you to make us proud. We want you to become successful so that you can be outstanding within not only this community, community, but to wherever God would have you go. Because you know something? That's what Nathan's desire was, is that you become an instrument that God could use to share the goodness and the love and the, and the, the blessing of coming to know the Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. So I encourage you today... That if your heart has been moved or if you've listened to anything that I've said here today, that you realize there is a true Savior, there is a true Lord, and He loves you, 
He cares for you, and He has a plan for your life. You know, it took a blueprint to build this building. If we didn't have a blueprint, we'd have toilets on a ceiling, and we'd have lights in the floor. And ladies, you wouldn't like that, especially with a dress on. But you know what? A blueprint gives you direction. It shows you where everything goes. And the beauty of it is, is there's a blueprint out there, and it's called the Word of God. And if you embrace it, and you embrace the Lord and Savior of that Word, and you begin to incorporate it into your life, and begin to allow it to get into your heart, then you will begin to have the wisdom that is far above any wisdom that exists on this planet. And you will begin to be able to to make the wisest decisions for your future and you'll begin to experience the greatest relationship that you could ever have on this planet. Nathan understood it, Nathan believed it, and Nathan's desire was to tell you about it. Unfortunately, he's not here to do that. But you know what? I think his life said enough. I think he spoke with what he did. I think he spoke how he lived. I am so honored to have the privilege of addressing you today. I am so honored as Nathan's father to, to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts, what you did for our family, the prayers you prayed, the, thing, the funds that you raised, the, things, the sacrifices that you made out of your time and what have you. But you know something, I would feel like I would be derelict of my commitment to Nathan to never quit like he never quit. That if I didn't ask you to bow your heads and just simply repeat a prayer after me. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm just simply asking you, between you and the Lord right now, that you would open your heart and receive his love and his goodness. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and forgiving me of my sins. Right now, Father, I ask you to come into my heart and let me experience the love that Nathan experienced. I thank you now, Father, in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Thank you very much, folks. I love you, and God bless.